Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, as you can tell, we're back in Acts. We're still in Acts. Um, FYI for next week, hoping to jump out of Acts where we'll talk about one big story. Um, what is that one big story that we read about in Scripture, beginning with creation? <laughs> and what does the Bible say about God creating the world and the fall, which is essential to understanding our faith as Christians? And then we'll talk about redemption and then restoration as well. And as we think about politics, I, the reason why I fit this in before our uh, series on politics is as we think about God, government, and the gospel, I want us to have a right frame about how to understand uh, what is contentious in this world right now. You know that, I know that, and I thought putting this right before, where we, especially ending with um, restoration, there's a hope to come, I think is really essential as we think biblically about um, government and politics and all that. So that's what's coming. Um, I just, I need to pray real quick. I know Joshua just prayed, if you could indulge me, I just want to pray briefly for God's help, and then we're just going to dive into quite the text that Joshua read. We got followers of John the Baptist, we got sons of Skeva, we got exorcisms, we got um, many things going on, black magic, the occult going on. How does all this fit together, and what does that mean for us? What does that mean for the kingdom? So, we'll pray, and then we'll See if we can put it together and see what God says. Oh, Father, once again, we come under your word, knowing that your word is authoritative and instructive for our life, but it also changes. It can illuminate our mind and bring change to our heart. And so I pray that by the power of your spirit, that you can cause me to, to speak well about your word and help us all to walk away um, challenged by your word, encouraged by your word, and thinking biblically about the world around us, and knowing that your kingdom continues to advance even when all around us it seems like, what is going on? You can encourage us. I pray that you do that in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I was uh, up early, as I usually am on Sunday mornings, and I kind of just skimming the news, and um, I saw this sign, and um, you know, as you know, there's protesting and counter-protesting across the country. Um... And uh, the sign said, uh, from one of the protesters, facts do not matter. It's quite, a, quite the statement. Facts do not matter. Now, I'm not going not to get into who was holding the sign or whatever else have you, but it caught my attention. Like, they don't matter? In a sane world, <laughs> you can combat lies with truth You can detect what is false with facts. You can comprehend reality without the poison of what is called postmodern relativism. If there is no, like, standard of truth, if facts are fiction and relativism is real, then what's the problem? Our faith is in vain. If that person's sign is true, then we have a lot of problems when we consider our own faith. Why? Because the Christian faith is built upon truth located in God's Word, what Joshua read from. Our faith is located in the truth of God's Word. The facts of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of our Christian faith. And everyday reality is supposed to be informed and governed by the truthful teachings of of God. Now go back to the sign. You see how that could impact you if that were actually true, which is ironic? <laughs> now I'm, I'm not going to rail against like the cultural machine, although it takes only five minutes of watching the news, another minute on social media to tell you truth, facts, and reality are under attack. I'm not going to rage against the cultural machine right now, but I want to ask two questions, especially as it pertains to Acts 19. What does the book of Acts tell us about the standard of truth? In particular, Acts 19. What does the book of Acts tell us about a standard of truth? And so the way to sniff out the lie is to know the truth. That's the first question. Here's the second question. How do we make sense of chaos with what we believe to be the standard of the truth. So you look out in the world, there's chaos. How do we understand that? What's the right framework? We call that also call that a worldview. 
What you see going on in the world is actually not new. It might feel new to you. But you need to be able to interpret the world by the standard of truth. Uh, I've used this example recently, and I wanted to go back to it because I think it's helpful. You know, the Constitution of the United States is supposed to be the standard of truth in which laws created by our government are judged. So if Congress passes a law that does, that does not square with, with the Constitution, the law is said to be unconstitutional and it's struck down. In theory, that's how it's all supposed to work. Now, Acts 19 provides some answers to the two questions. We do know the standard of truth. In Acts, we read it's the teachings about the kingdom of God. And everything is judged against the teachings of the kingdom of God. So we see that pop up again. We've seen it woven in. I said this in the very first sermon throughout Acts. The, the, the teachings of the kingdom of God are woven in to the very end. Now before we get to that, let's just try to get our bearings. Let's see where we're at in Acts. Because as you know, the travel throughout Acts goes at a frenetic pace. We're in one city one week. We're in another city the next week. Here it says in verse 1, It had happened while Apollos was in Corinth... Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. Last week, Paul was in Ephesus, or Apollos was in Ephesus, excuse me, but he moved on to Corinth, but Paul decided to go back to Ephesus. It was just like, how do you try to keep up with all the moving and all the, all the evangelism going on throughout the area? So Dateline, we are the city of Ephesus. Again, although it's not Apollos we're talking about, it is Paul who takes center stage. Ephesus is the fourth city Fourth largest city of the Roman Empire. It was known for its vast banking system and uh, intense spirituality. If Athens from previous weeks is like Boston because of its academic reputation and Corinth is like Vegas for obvious reasons, then Ephesus is kind of like New York. Banking and commerce ruled the city. And the city also had, a, had the temple of Artemis, which is considered to, to this day one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, the Artemis worshipped in Ephesus was the goddess of fertility from the region of, the, of Anatolia, and over time just became a Greek goddess in this particular area. So, in addition to be a city of commerce and banking, Ephesus was a very spiritual city. And as we're going to see in a moment, it was a spiritually diverse city. And what this passage is going to help us wrestle with is how to understand and judge spiritual or religious systems against the teachings of God's kingdom. We know Jesus was consumed with teaching about the kingdom of God, Acts 1-3. And the Apostle Paul spent every moment continuing to teach about the kingdom until his death, Acts 28-20. The phrase, the kingdom of God, um, comes up again in verse 8. I'm sure you saw it as Joshua read. If it wasn't clear, here it is again. And he, Paul, in verse 8, entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, three months straight, in the synagogue, in the same place, spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about what? The kingdom of God. Contrary to popular belief in terms of many Christians when they read the New Testament, the, the message of the kingdom of God um, just did not pop up when you turn the page from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And Jesus, nor John the Baptist, who both preached about the kingdom, did not have to explain to their listeners what the kingdom of God was all about because there were some underlining assumptions that they already knew. The listeners already knew what Jesus meant when he said, kingdom of God. In, in a sense, the whole and entire Old Testament message is about the kingdom of God, even though the phrase actually only comes up seven times in the Old Testament. So here's the message of the Old Testament. It's about the coming ruler who will establish his kingdom everywhere. The Old Testament is about God's expressed intention to restore all that Satan destroyed in Eden. The message of the kingdom in the Old Testament is about God winning back his rebellious people. And when God's people are won back, they are in a position to worship, honor, and glorify the king that won them back. 
we read in the Gospels, Jesus is king. Therefore, Paul's burden was to persuade the Jews that the Messiah that they had been looking for had already come and His name is Jesus. Paul's burden to tell the Gentiles for the very first time, many times for the very first time, that God's glorious plan of redemption and restoration is through King Jesus. So the mission and the teaching of the kingdom of God is about this promised king that has come. He has come to restore and redeem his elect people. He has come to claim every square inch of the earth. He has come to claim every square inch of the universe. And God's kingdom is advancing. His kingdom continues to move forth and expand. Here's what we see in the scriptures. There is opposition. There are evil forces that despise God's plan of redemption and restoration. They are pushing back against God's kingdom. They're trying to push back against God's kingdom. And we need to discern and identify these cosmic forces that manifest themselves in everyday reality. Once we, once we can determine the evil forces, we can judge against these comic forces and the teachings connected to it against the ultimate standard of truth. The teaching of the kingdom are facts. The, the teachings of the kingdom tell us reality. As Christians, the, key, the teachings of the kingdom are what we uphold and what we continue to hold on to. So, there are four different, what I want to call spiritual forces or worldviews working contrary to the kingdom in Acts 19, verses 1 to 20. Three, I think, are very clear, and the other one is a modern-day manipulation of something that we read about in this passage. Here, here they are, and then we'll look at them one at a time. There's a first, I would call like a worldview or, or a cosmic fork. We, we see the disciples of John popping up again. They play center stage at the beginning of our passage. Number two, we have these sons of Skeva. And then three, we see the occult. And then number four... We have an additional contemporary problem that we just need to think through because it comes up in our day. So let me deal with them one at a time. Let's begin on a somewhat positive note. Last week we saw that Apollos was a disciple of John the Baptist who was preaching Jesus from the Old Testament, right? You got Apollos, he's reading his Old Testament, and he understands the gospel. It's beautiful. He had some gaps in his theology, so the married couple, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, come alongside Apollos just to help him out. Again, we read that they were disciples of John the Baptist in this particular passage, but they were not saved. I think that's pretty clear from our text. They believed in the Old Testament message about the kingdom of God, but they were never told about Jesus. Here are verses 1 and 2, the last part of verse 1 and verse 2. There they found some disciples. And he said to them, Paul, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no. We've not even heard <laughs> that there's a Holy Spirit. Like, what are you talking about? This is a completely new. Now go to verse 4. And Paul said, you know, John baptized, the John that you follow, he baptized because of repentance telling people to believe in the one who has come after him. And you know what? His name is Jesus. Paul told these disciples of John the Baptist, the fulfillment of God's promise, Messiah, is Jesus. So in a matter of moments, it seems to me, the switch was flipped when the Holy Spirit fell upon these guys. Paul told them about Jesus. Holy Spirit falls and regenerates the heart. They began to speak in tongues, we read, and began to prophesy. The story is reminiscent of what we read if you go back to Acts 2 and the story of Pentecost. Now first notice the essential role of the Holy Spirit in this text. And we see it all throughout Acts. A person cannot be saved without the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit drawing a rebellious sinner to God by revealing Jesus to the cold, dead heart. I'll just make it real simple. No Holy Spirit, no Jesus. (laughs) If the Holy Spirit is present, you get all of Jesus. We have to make sure that when we talk about salvation, the Holy Spirit is there at work in the life of an individual, revealing Christ to the heart of an individual. Don't carve out the Holy Spirit and just talk about Jesus. We need to talk about all of of what God is doing in salvation. Second, the salvation of a soul must include the entire truth about Jesus. I mean, what do I mean? Your faith cannot rest on the idea of Jesus. Think about that. Your faith cannot rest on, in the idea of Jesus. Your faith must rest upon the person of Christ. Your faith must rest upon what Christ has done at the cross forgiving sin through his death. Your faith must rest upon the fact that Christ defeated sin and death by rising from the, de- from the dead and walking out of a tomb. The disciples of John the Baptist did not know the entire truth. They believed in the idea of Jesus as, is, as explained in the Old Testament. And think of it this way. The devil would have loved for these followers of John the Baptist to continue in believing in the idea about Jesus and not in Jesus himself. How can we apply this passage to our lives, this part of the passage? Well, you must make sure your given faith is in the person of Christ and not in the nice idea about Christ. I even think about parenting, right? Um, how we disciple our children. Are we, giving, are we communicating the ideas? Are we communicating the person who has saved? The nice idea of Jesus does not extend grace and mercy to a rebellious sinner. The nice concept of Jesus does not redeem and restore. It takes the person of a holy, living Son of God to extend mercy and grace. It takes the holy, living Son of God to take your cold, dead heart and make it alive. Whatever ideas of of Christianity you might have, it must always flow from and point back to the person of Jesus Christ. The teachings about the kingdom of God tell us Jesus is the standard of truth. And that's part of what Paul was communicating to these disciples of John the Baptist. Here is the standard of truth. It is Jesus. The second spiritual force opposing the kingdom of God is found in the story about the sons of Sceva, verses 11 To 17. Here are the cliff notes about the sons of Sceva and why their situation matters. Jewish preachers were walking around town pretending to take evil spirits out of people. Uh, They were called exorcists. Now, exorcism is not a foreign concept in the Bible. Jesus did plenty of them as we read in the Gospels. But these guys who did not believe Jesus is the Son of God were saying, verse 13, I adjure you by the name of Jesus and what Paul proclaims, come out. These guys were the son of a Jewish high priest named Sceva, hence the name Sons of Sceva. Well, their shenanigans backfired on them. It seems like, from the text, that they were trying to get an evil spirit out of a person, and then the evil spirit kind of calls their bluff. It says in verse 15, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? These evil spirits were not having it. It took control of the seven sons, and all of a sudden they ran out of the house naked and wounded. Everyone around Ephesus heard about it. The sons running out of the house nude would have been the ultimate moment of shame for them, especially in light of their Jewish faith. So that's the cliff notes. I grant it seems like a really weird story. So what's the takeaway? The first takeaway is um, 
Christocentric. It's about Christ once again. It says in verse 17 that a result of the situation is that the people in Ephesus began to fear God and magnify and honor Jesus. The end goal of all things, good and bad, is for Jesus to be glorified. What else can we learn from this passage? Evil spirits exist. Evil spirits are working against the kingdom of God. Evil spirits are working against the kingdom of God by holding individuals captive and self-contained in like what I would think of as a personal prison. I feel like I need to su- su- supplement uh, what is going on in Acts with another scripture to drive home the point. Here's Ephesians 2. Paul says to the Ephesians, you wonder why Paul specifically said this because of what he is actually experiencing in Ephesus. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Think about that, flesh and blood, your body. Think think about where he's going with his argument here in a moment. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6.2. Christians need to realize there's more going on than what we see in the material world. There's more than what you see right in front of you right now. There's more than what is going on in the tangible, just grabbing this podium, what is tangible. The material world is the stage for the spiritual world. What is interesting about this story in Acts is that these evil spirits also knew who had the ultimate authority. Here's what we read in the book of James, James 2.19. You believe God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. These seven sons had no authority. That's clear. And whatever authority the evil spirits had, it was submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ. As for these seven phonies, they're like modern-day, quote, ministers who go around taking money from the poor and pretending to heal. And I say that as a person who does believe in the revelatory gifts and that they have not ceased. What's going on is that these guys are trying to take advantage of the name of Christ, which is despicable. But these evil spirits knew they were phonies, and eventually the phonies became their victims. So here are two application points about the story regarding the sons of Skeva. First, Like I said, we live in a material and spiritual world. They exist together. And second, Jesus is more significant and more powerful, has more authority than any evil spirit or enemy. Jesus is supreme. The devil, the demons, and the evil spirits recognize the authority of Jesus. We see that in the Gospels, and we see it once again in this particular passage. The third spiritual force or worldview working against the kingdom of God is what I'm going to call the occult. You're familiar with that word. It doesn't come specifically in our text, but let's call it that. It helps us understand what's going on a little bit better. The occult practice is often described as magic. That does come up in our text. Magic was being used, but the occult is often described as magic used to connect a person with the supernatural or mystical. So think astrology, alchemy, natural magic, and divination are occult. Uh, Specific categories of of these broader categories include voodoo, tarot cards, Ouija boards. And I'm going to be real straight here. These practices are evil. Here's a quick story. 
about a run-in I've had with the occult, and I've had, I have plenty of stories. The summer after my senior year of high school, a friend of mine had invited myself and a bunch of other friends up to her house just to hang out. It was like a summer afternoon, nothing going on. We're just hanging out, playing games. And then our host all of a sudden pulls out a Ouija board. And I didn't know anything about it. I've never really heard of it. I mean, I may have heard of it, but never played it, right? But I'm like, okay, it seems like a board game. It's like, grab the Monopoly and let's go. So it seemed innocent, just a bunch of young adults hanging out. Well, I joined in. As we played, darkness began to overwhelm my soul. It's hard to explain what I experienced, but I do know, and I still remember what I felt. Midway through the use of the Ouija board, I refused to call it a game. I just got up and left. I went outside. And the moment I went outside, whatever was oppressing me just left. And then just, you know what, I'm like, I'm walking home. That's how disturbed I was. I'm like, I'm out of here. And so I walked home. Now, is the material that makes up the Ouija board evil? No, I don't, I don't think so. Can evil spirits exploit the attempt of a person to, to communicate with the dead through a Ouija board? Absolutely. So I don't share the story to scare anyone into thinking an evil spirit is around every corner. No, Christians serve a victorious king who has power over <laughs> evil spirits. I do think it is good to be aware but there is no need to fear. Why? The truth of the kingdom is greater than a Ouija board, tarot cards, or voodoo dolls. What we see in this passage is how the power of the gospel sets people free from what is evil. Verse 19 is such a hopeful passage for those who are held captive by evil. Here it is. And a number of those who practice magic arts brought their books together, and burned them in the sight of all. Now, I'm not a fan of burning books, but the burning of books is not the point. Their actions, those who are practicing magic, dark magic, evil magic, they were communicating repentance. Their actions communicated some type of confession. We've seen what Jesus is doing, and that is far greater, far superior than any of these things that we've been doing. And it's almost like a holy fear came over them. They're like, ah, we're done with this. Get the book, throw it away. You know what? Go ahead and get the match. Let's light it up. Because we don't need that, and no one else needs that. What we need is more of Jesus. That's what we need. These individuals were turning away from magic and toward Jesus. That's the point of the book burning. Which, by the way, when you take what is estimated, what is the estimated value of the books that were burnt, and you kind of like translate that into modern day currency, $35,000 or more, there's a lot of magic. A lot of books about magic being burned in that moment. That is the power of the gospel right there. You may have had a similar experience without the burning of books, right? When people turn to Jesus, they stop listening to certain kinds of music or watching specific movies, right? They stop engaging in activities that perpetuate their evil behavior. Um, after the Lord saved me, there were several musical artists and bands that I put on my do not listen to list, <laughs> Why? In part, I wanted my ears and my heart to hear the truth. I wanted to saturate myself in truth. But also, a couple bands, frankly, reminded me of my rebellious life before Christ. So I'm like, you know, why do we even need that? My conscience was telling me at the time, dude, knock it off. What you need is a whole lot of Jesus. So here's the main takeaway from this particular part of our passage. Once again, Jesus is greater than the occult. 
Jesus is better than the occult. Jesus is more powerful than the occult. The occult cannot stop the loving and gracious mission of King Jesus. His kingdom marches forth. And that is great news for us. Thus far from this passage, I've identified three spiritual forces or worldviews that are futilely working against the advancement of the kingdom of God. We see the disciples of John the Baptist who need to hear the truth about Jesus, the sons of Sceva using and abusing the name of Jesus to perform an exorcism in the occult, the magic arts, trying to keep people um, from seeing the light of the gospel. And we know that Jesus is more excellent. I'm going to mention a, a fourth spiritual, what I'm going to call a spiritual abuse. It's not explicitly named, but there are specific things mentioned in our passage that do get abused. Just like what we have already seen, people can use the the name of Jesus in the Bible for personal gain. In verse 11, it says that an extraordinary miracle took place. It says when a person touched the handkerchief that Paul touched, evil spirits left that person. Now, did this really happen? I believe it did. It's in the text. It's in God's Word. Does it still occur? I don't think so. The supplied word in verse 11, extraordinary, is there to help us understand the unique nature of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. You can note that when we talk about tongues and prophesying, extraordinary is not used there, but it's used right here. Again, I'm a charismatic. I believe the spiritual gifts have not ceased. But here, the original Greek tells us that something unique has taken place. So I take issue when God's word is used for personal gain through intentional harm. Here's what I mean. Some years ago, before I even became a Christian, I'm like, you know, flipping on the TV, late night television, and I come across a a Christian television station. I'm sure you guys can catalog all those in your head, especially, you know, 20 years ago. And as I watched, this this minister basically said, if you buy this handkerchief and you touch it, you will be healed. Of course, a person needs to shell out the cash before the handkerchief is shipped. What passage did he cite? Acts 19, verses 11 and 12. Listen, I'm not about throwing people under the bus. I can name names. We all can name names. But I am about exposing lies and upholding kingdom truths. And this kind of health, wealth, and prosperity propaganda is dangerous. It's a false gospel. It is also anti-kingdom. Just like the other three that I had mentioned, this one is pushing against kingdom truth by abusing God's word and creating lies. Jesus takes exception with this kind of deception. You know, the, the garbage that was going on in the first century isn't much different today. Sometimes it looks the same, but sometimes there's just different wrapping paper over the package, and inside the package is just simply the same substance. But here is the point of today's passage. I've said it once, I've said it twice, I'll say it again. The kingdom of God and the truth about the kingdom will not stop. It does not cease yet. It will continue until Jesus in his good and perfect timing comes back to restore the brokenness. He will put away the lies, the evil spirits, the Ouija board, and the deception. Until Jesus comes back, we need to realize we are still a part of a kingdom where verse 20 is still happening. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevailed mightily. That is going to be true until Jesus comes back. And we, the church, have the great privilege to preach and to teach the kingdom of God to those who do not have the entire truth. We preach to those who are deceiving and to those who are being deceived. And we tell others about the kingdom of God like those who are held in bondage by the occult. God uses us to tell others of the power and authority 
of a great king who extends mercy, lavishes grace, and saves souls from damnation to an everlasting relationship and an everlasting life in an everlasting kingdom with Jesus. That is what we're a part of. So as we look out in a world full of chaos, we do not need to be dismayed. We do not need to fear. We need to realize we are part of a great mission. We are part of God's kingdom. And ultimately, He will have His way. Let's pray.